In this video, I'm going to run through some of the updates for Mosaic 12.2. 12.2 has recently been released and is available to download from the Mosaic user forum today. So let's take a look at one of the first options here, which is the new option to have a high detail part display. Let's take a look at some practical examples. Let's look at a 3D here of a room that has a couple of products in there. On the left hand side of the screen, we have the original non high detail part display options. And on the right hand side, we have the high detail part display option enabled. So by zooming in nice and close on the kicks here, what we can see on the left hand side of the screen, the original kick does not have the new part high detail part display enabled. And the kick on the right hand side has the high detail part display enabled. So what we can see is that it's showing our miter join on the new option on the right hand side. Let's take a look at how that works. If we open up this kick product and go to the parts list, and we're gonna click on one of the parts that shows the miter, and we're gonna go into edit here. The new option is just enabled on the right-hand side here, which says high detail. So what that is, is basically giving you the ability to nominate the high detail to be shown on an individual part-by-part -part basis. Previously, you would have needed to go to the 3D viewer in a product and going into the layers and enabling the high detail for the entire product. The brilliant thing about this is it allows you to show that high detail and also save that product into your library with that high detail enabled and only doing that on the products that it is relevant to. So it's not needing to show all of the parts in high detail, simply the ones that you ask for that to be relevant to. So another great example of that would be a bulkhead product as well, where the bulkhead will want to show that same miter join. So if we have a look here and just Zoom in on the miter join, you can see that we've got the, the miter join showing on that bulkhead product. And another great example would be a undermount range hood. So for example, in this undermount range hood, if we look at this in 3D, this one doesn't have the part high detail display turned on. We can't see the bottom cutout. We can't see the top cutout. And if we scroll across to the option where I've gone through these parts and click on the part and go and enable the high detail view, we look at that in 3D now, we're going to see a nice um, preview that's showing us, you know, we can see the kick, we can see the cutout, we can see the full detail. And that's really important. It's just uh, a way of just doing this and then being able to save that back into your library and updating that product with that functionality turned on. Getting that message across to your customers on the floor plan and elevations and 3D is not just the individual product levels. So bringing that high detail display to the room 3D is, uh, is a brilliant part of that new feature. Now let's take a look at the next option in the list, which is the new precision snapping tool. This is a really cool option and it just really gives you the ability to choose whatever you need as a snap point and create dimension lines by having additional snap points. Let's take a look at a couple of practical ways where you could use this. So the first of all, I'll show you the existing method. If we go to dimension a product here and I want to go ahead and dimension from the back of my bar back panel to the front of the door, as you'll see, there's no snap point on the front of the door. I can get to the product, but I can't get to the front of the door. And that was a practical reason why this new feature has been created. So let's take a look at it. Over on the right-hand side, you've got a magnet symbol, and that, that basically was a toggle to turn your snapping on and off. So what that's changed to is now a three-part selection. So if I click once, it will now show a lightning bolt icon there, which I always hear the echoes of ACDC Thunderstruck whenever I enable that. So I think it's mandatory to sort of play that tune in your mind as you enable that option. But as soon as you enable that option, now everything becomes a snap point. So if I go ahead and go to the dimension tool and click on the back point, and as you'll see now, I'm able to pick up the front point of that door really easily. So, you know, you can toggle between having the snaps completely off, having them set to the legacy way of just the only the product points as the snap points, the outside of the cabinets or having the precision snap mode on, which will give you all the points as a snap point. That's gonna be really useful for examples like this, you know, where maybe you even wanna dimension between, you, between your door products from that door. You know, so maybe say I wanna go from the door on this side to the door on this side and understand kind of what the distance is between those, those sets of doors. You've got the ability to do that much easier now. And that's uh, also available in multi-print as well. So if I go into file print and multi-print and in multi-print there, I've got the same option. I can go over to my snap point and toggle that to the new precision snap mode. So I think that's going to be a really, uh, a really great new feature that's going to enable dimensioning at a much easier way without having to flatten the scene to get more points. It's, you've got the, still the live scenes, 
enable your, your precision snap mode and then go to town on, on adding all the dimension lines you need and having much more visibility over the snap points to do so. So that's precision snapping. Let's take a look at the decode naming. Uh, this is one of my personal favorites. This is one that I lobbied pretty hard for uh, to, to have as a new addition in Mosaic. So uh, let me walk you through it. First of all, if you go into the libraries and go to your material library, you'll notice a new column has been created at the end of the, the columns here for the material abbreviated name, right? So, so at the start here, I've got my material name as white HMR 16 millimeters, and I've abbreviated that name down to W16. The whole idea here is instead of you just having to use long and short file names, you've got the ability to now have an abbreviated G code file naming which can still have a combination of your material and your job name, but in a much more condensed format. So I'll demonstrate this, but uh, what I'd recommend doing first is just going through your material library and coming up with some abbreviated names that keep the names nice and short, that make sense uh, for the workflow in your factory. As you can see, I've done that in our standard kind of material library here, and I've just created a material code that makes sense to me, but feel free to go through your library and do the same. It only takes a couple of minutes to go through and just add in your abbreviated names. Now, once you've got your abbreviated material name there, on every job that you create in Mosaic, you'll now have a new tab for the abbreviated job name. But this could be really useful. This could be linked to an invoice number or a job number, or, or you could actually just you know abbreviate the name down to a short version of this. So you can see in, in this particular case, my job name is version 12 underscore two update. So I'm gonna go ahead and let's just call this 12 underscore two. And I'm going to leave it at that. Let's go to the cut list now. And uh, actually, I'll just save this job first and we'll go to the cut list. And then let's take the one of those rooms through. So I'm going to just go ahead and take my abbreviated G code name room through to the optimizer. I'm going to go ahead and just take, say, whiteboard color one and color two through to the optimizer. And you'll see that open in just a second. And let's go through the process now of optimizing this out and creating some G code. So regardless of which machine you have nominated there. If we can go ahead and just do, I might just do all the materials at once. So I'm just gonna go ahead and choose my batch optimize option and select all my materials, go ahead and let that happen. And then I'm gonna go ahead and press generate G code for multiple materials. And I'm gonna nominate that I want that across all of my materials and away I go. So now it has created the G code. Let's take a look at the naming convention here. So as we can see the G code file name for the color one is 12 underscore two, which is my abbreviated job name, underscore C1 underscore 18, which is my abbreviated material name, and then underscore sheet 01 revision 01. So it's a much um, more condensed name in a, in a format that I think will, will you know really open up the opportunities for people. We've seen C machines that have quite a limited file character limit, it just enables you to get a, a you know, a unique name that is is um, not going to be overridden at the machine. That's going to work right through to auto labeling customers as well. So I think for anyone running an auto labeling machine, you want to enable this right away. The way to enable that is if you go to libraries and into machines, what you want to do there is go to setup CNC router. And then with your file names, you want to go ahead and choose the abbreviated. Previously, that was just a tick box for short. The long file name is the original file name. So just to show you the difference between all three of these, let's go to long and hit OK. And we'll go ahead and regenerate our G codes. So let's go to G code and we'll do all of those materials again. And we'll re-G code them so we can see the difference. So let's go to G code. And as you'll see now, that G code name is much longer. It's using the full job name, version 12 underscore to update the full material name, color one 18 millimeters and then the sheet 01 revision 02 now as it's the second revision. Now, if I go back into the machines and set up CNC router and I change that to the short file naming method, what that will be is just the last few characters of that. So we'll go into patterns, we'll generate our G code and same thing, let's do that for each of these and we'll go ahead and confirm that back to G code and what you'll see now is it's just sheet 01 revision 03. So I think the, abbreviated name will become the new standard and it is just a happy medium between those two options that gives you the best of both worlds. So what I would suggest is enabling that and then go ahead and you know output your G code using your new material abbreviated names with your new job abbreviated names and you're gonna have a much cleaner G code name. Just on that note too, there's another new option there. If you go into the settings and preferences, there is an ability here to untick 
to create material subfolder. So what that means is when you create G code in Mosaic, it would put the G code into a folder within a folder. So let's uh, go ahead and take a look at that, how that looks. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up my Mosaic G code files from my desktop, as you can see. And what we're gonna do here is open up this job, which we can see the job is called version 12.2 update. And as you can see, all of my materials are in the one folder. So I've got my color one 18, my color two 18, and my white 16 all stored together which is a really big win for certain machines that aren't really supporting subfolders. So if your machine workflow works much better without having subfolders enabled, then you can store everything in the one folder much cleaner. So just to show you the difference there, if I go back to Mosaic and I go ahead and enable my material subfolder, this would have been the standard behavior pre 12.2. So let's just go ahead and generate the code for each of those materials, just so we can see the difference there. And we'll go ahead and do that. And we'll go back to these folders. And now, as you can see in my 12.2 update folder, the materials are separated out into individual folders, which, you know, that might work well for your machine. If it does, no problem at all. You can leave that option enabled. If your machine would work better without the additional subfolders, then you can go in and now untick that and go ahead and um, take advantage of that new functionality. Okay, let's go back to Mosaic and let's jump in to the next option, which is the option to have a part comment and the fit to bounds option now on labels. So this is a really nice update to the labeling option. So if we go into file, print, and then print labels, let's go into the edit option and we'll go ahead and choose a label design. So the first thing here I'm gonna highlight is that a new option is available in the variables. So if we go into variables and then down to parts, and right down the bottom there, you're gonna see the new variable called part comment. What that's going to do is pull through any part comments that you've added to the part. So what I've done here is I've just gone to my object settings and I've highlighted that in red. Now, a couple of key things I'll point out here with this one, definitely these two new features kind of work hand in hand together because a part comment could be quite a long amount of text. So you've now got the ability on any of these fields to right click and go to edit text alignment slash rotation. And the, the new option is this option here called fit to bounds. So if you enable the fit to bounds option, what that means, it's gonna sort of automatically resize the font to keep it within the bounds of this particular space, which is really cool. So if we go into preview here, you can, you're gonna see this working really well. So we can see our part comment says trim part in half on source. So that's just a random comment I've written on one of the parts. I'll show you where to do that as well in a second. But the fit to bounds option I've enabled on all of my fields. So as the width and length is a, is a smaller field, it's, it's grown in font size. As my cabinet number is a smaller field as well, that's also grown in font size. As I've got more uh, text over here in my room name and my job name, then those ones have shrunken in, in font size to keep the, the text contained or bound to the actual field that they've written in. One thing I would say would be to feel free to go through and increase your font sizes because even with a, a really large font size on this one here, it's not going to exceed the bounds of the, the text. As you can see, as I'm increasing this to a really large font size, it's keeping the text within the bounds of that. So if I go to preview now, even though I've got a size 36 font, you can see it's just gone as big as it can possibly make that. So worth actually setting your, your text sizes to a large number to make sure that you know, you're taking full advantage of making the text as large as possible in each of these variables. So you can go through and set that to the biggest and then you're gonna get, you know, it's gonna just go and, and stretch that out to as big as it can possibly be to fit on the label. So I think that's definitely really worthwhile doing. And just to point out where the part comment reads from, if I go back here and out of this area and we go to a particular part, I'm just gonna choose any component here and I go to the parts list, I can click on any one of my components and press edit. And then here you'll see that, you know, you've got a comment and that's the part comment. So that can be, you could write whatever you need there and that could be translated on your labels. So that way it can really pass information along to the, the crew in the factory, the way they might need to do a secondary operation to that part or understand that that part has something that you wanted to convey to them. So worthwhile taking advantage of that one right away for sure. Let's take a look at the next option, which is the mirror bore option. So this one here is quite a, quite a simple one. It's, there's a new parameter that's been created in Mosaic called mirror ball. 
if you change that to yes, so just where you find this, if I go into select, it's in the boring case, and it's right down the bottom here, there's a new option called mirror ball. And what that means is that for single doors like this, it's going to mirror the hinge boring to the opposite side of the cabinet. So what we can see here is the hinge plate boring there, even though I've got a right hand hinge selected, it is enabling the left hand hinge boring option as well, because what it's trying to do there is mirror this to the opposite side. Commonly requested option for uh, cut to size companies that offer flat packs where you know the client might want to be able to bore that left or right. Now you've got the ability to just enable mirror bore and that'll happen automatically. So nice, easy and quick win there to take advantage of. There's been a couple of speed improvements and just in the way we're handling materials has also been improved as well. So I'm going to flick across to the my mosaic folder so I can highlight that for you. So inside your C drive mosaic data or wherever your data folder is path to and stored to on your computer, you're going to notice that there's a new file created in here, right? And almost people probably wouldn't notice this if I don't point it out. So I wanted to take the time to do this. Let's scroll down and take a look at the DAT files. There's a new one called material templates.dat. Okay, so what that is, that'll, that's gonna be auto-generated when you install 12.2, and that's where all the material templates are now going to be stored. The intention really is to minimize the content in the data folder and clean this up. So it also will help Mosaic load uh, much faster as well because now we're not loading as many individual files. But to take advantage of that new feature, you do need to remove the old templates that we no longer need as they've, they've now been imported into 12.2. So important thing is make sure you install 12.2 first and then follow the steps here to clean up your templates. So what I'd recommend doing there is just in the data folder, sorting via type, just drop the menu down. If you're running current versions of Windows, you'll be able to click the down arrow. And I would recommend just ticking any of the options that have TMP at the end here. So we're gonna do the band template, the cabinet templates, the door templates, the drawer templates, the edge templates, and then the top templates and also the material templates. So all of those there. Now, what I've done there effectively is filtered this list to only those. And as you can see, there's 220 items in my material library. There's quite a few items that Mosaic has to load and check for every time you open Mosaic, right? So now what we can do is actually just highlight all of them and either delete them, or what I recommend doing is just cutting them and moving them somewhere else in a, as a backup. So I'd recommend just going to the cut option. I would go into my Mosaic folder and maybe into backups or anywhere else and create a folder. I've created one here called old material templates, and I'm gonna go ahead and paste them in there. So what that does, that um, moves them out of the data folder, allowing Mosaic to open and close quicker. And as you can see now, it also condenses that data folder down to a much more manageable list you know, less clutter that's, that's no longer needed. So it's a speed improvement, but also a storage improvement on, the, on our side. So highly recommend you take advantage of that function as well. A couple other key ones that have uh, changed in 12.2, in your library parameters, you've now got the ability to branch out the back scribe for the back top scribe. So if we go into parameters here and we go down to your scribes. So we're gonna find that in the scribes folder. And you'll see in the back top scribe, you've now got the ability to branch that out and control the back top scribe independently for base cabinets, wall cabinets, and tall cabinets. So just giving you that extra level of control, which particular type of products you want to apply that back scribe to. Coming back out of there, one of the other features that has changed in your order entry, you've now it's been improved or enhanced in the, the data that you can export out. We've got examples of that, and I'll post a link when I share this video to those updated examples. So you can also import a door order file now as well. So for any of the door manufacturers out there or the cut to size companies, you've now got the ability to import a door order profile, which is really cool because you can take advantage of the, the profile selections and the tooling selections and everything like that. So that's been improved as well. Thank you for watching and catch you on the next video.